Hey everyone, I'm Luke and welcome to Exploring Kodawari. In this episode, we explore the concept of communication from a few different angles. We start with the mind-blowing idea that all communication, whether it's between languages or within the same language, is a translation. Maybe this is obvious to some, but I only fully realized this after I began learning Turkish and then later realized how much it existed inside of English as well. And all translations involve some loss or change in the information that was originally being communicated. From there, we talk about a few different theories about how our human ancestors might have acquired language, from the universal grammar of Noam Chomsky to the idea that language grew out of collective rituals like grooming, music, dance, or other symbolic representation. There's a lot of debate on that front, but however language appeared, it is unique to humans, and it's probably why we so quickly outcompeted the other non-sapien homo species of the time. In short, language allows for the creation of shared myths, metaphorical truths, that could organize homo sapiens into much larger groups. And unlike physical characteristics, which are beholden to the slow evolution of genes and biology, stories and culture can adapt very quickly to meet the changing demands of the environment. And then after we zoomed out on the history of language like that, and since Yanka is over six years into learning English and I've been learning Turkish for about four years, we finish by talking through what it's like to learn a second language and all of the funny situations that it causes, especially in our own relationship. So yeah, this episode was just another one with Yanka and I talking. We hope you like these. We enjoy just sitting down and forcing ourselves to do some research and better understand something that's been on our minds. I guess the meta point here that pertains to this episode is that conversation with another person, so dialogue, which itself comes from di logos, aka two minds trying to discover truth through speech, is a great process for organizing your thoughts. The attempt at communication itself of trying to translate your thoughts into another mind is one of the best ways to figure out what you think in the first place. Okay. If you do like what you hear, please consider supporting us with a rating or review or just sharing it with someone. And you can always extra support us with a small donation through our PayPal links. Basically, the more support we get, the more time we'll be able to find for you know doing the podcast and writing on the blog. And I love doing that. So we would greatly appreciate it. Either way, we're happy to have you listening and hope you enjoy the episode. Okay, it started. Exploring Kodawari mm-hmm. communication episode. Um, so I don't know how to start. <laughs> Great. I'm bad at communicating the beginnings of podcasts. Oh, I think you're so much better than I am. Um, I have that quote that I'm going to open with, but I actually thought let's just first open with like, what's your definition of communication? Like personally, um, having now lived in a different country from your origin country for five years. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's very, like you never realize how important it is and then the extents of it until your abilities are taken away from you. I'll just say it's vast. It's almost like (laughs) an evil wizard has, you know, put a spell on you to take away, like you you have all the same thoughts, but you can't uh, express them. Yeah. And then when you do manage to find the word you were looking for or something, and and then the delivery is off or the moment is gone or... um, you become more aware of what communication is when it's failing than when it's succeeding, I guess. That, that's that idea. very true. Yeah. Like you, I, I don't know. I don't want to get into too many details. How long did we're I gonna... pause there, by the way? It felt like five minutes. No, you're fine. Okay. <laughs> it was more like five seconds, but okay. it's fine. Um, we're going to get into more details probably about communication in different languages or second languages later, but it's almost like you develop this like personality persona. Like it's very attached to your language usage, obviously humor until like the age of 20, which was my case. And then all of a sudden you're a different person. Like yeah. half of your personality is just like stripped away from you because you don't have and the... You're probably more the, conscious of it since you changed countries and languages mm-hmm. at an older age. I imagine if you're like eight or nine, it's probably even more kind of messed up in your psychology. You're not quite sure who you are kind of thing. I think it might be the opposite because like you're so you just, much you aware. Used to it? Uh, yeah. Like I, if you're, I think like move to another country and start a different language speaking a different language at the age of eight or nine you transition way smoother i think like maybe you just merge the personalities i think so 
like uh, would you agree with that frame framework that uh, that when you learn a second language as an adult you sort of form this secondary personality yes absolutely i can't speak for anyone but i think like i definitely Certainly looks do. that way from the outside like when i see you interact <laughs> with um friends in turkish i just see a different energy more more um extroverted and confident and just you know leading the group by making the joke at the perfect time that cracks everyone up yeah whereas no offense you don't do that often in english I mean, although you are getting good at it with dropping seinfeld or curb your enthusiasm <laughs> lines yeah. at the right moment i think i'm um, like i moved here seven years ago so i'm like officially seven years old with my english abilities i'm thinking so <laughs> yeah the problem better. there is you're it's like it's like saying you're i mean you're an adult programming a seven-year-old. It's different than a seven-year-old programming a seven-year-old. I, mean, I know. Just like, you know, like, uh, if you teach an adult piano, and I know of all the failure <laughs> adult piano students, that is possible. But um, if you get the right one, like the elements are there, they can teach themselves very quickly if they actually put in the time and listen to what you mm -hmm. say and do the exercises you say and memorize this. And you can basically program them to play basic, basic, you know, piano like they can play melodies and chords mm -hmm. at the same time and all of that maybe they won't get a flowing beautiful effortless musical thing mm -hmm. going that depends on so many other things but it's different than a seven-year-old who you you have to be going through seven-year-old language centers when you're teaching a seven-year-old yeah but you didn't start with seven-year-old turkish to program seven-year-old english you had 20-year-old turkish right that's true. Basically, and very well read, smart, intelligent, like version of Turkish. Yeah. The same thing that you just were asking me, it should be like more traumatizing as an eight, nine year old to like move to a new place. I disagree with that. Just imagine how much easier it is to learn a sec Perhaps like more instrument. Perhaps more subconscious. Age. Yeah. Uh, that's what no, I no. Easier is the wrong word then. That's why we're getting confused. E easier might not be. Yeah. Um, more efficient. Efficient, okay. It's, but takes it's more natural, like you, you know. If natural means the way you learn your first language, where okay. it automatically seems to just absorb into your brain, like an, an infant that's just about to learn how to talk, they're mm -hmm. picking up, you know, hundreds of words a day and, and their subconscious is just wiring it in there. Yeah. What's the word for the thing on the uh, side of an airplane? wings yeah <laughs> yeah i mean where, where was that word right before i poked prodded you with that prompt you know who, who knows yeah if you asked me that in turkish i'd be like shit 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 did, did i ever learn that word i know i know uchush is flight i know uchak <laughs> is airplane um i know bird wing might be like you know bird tongue or something like, <laughs> like side tongue or something yeah. <laughs> anyway to like summarize what i was trying Obs to say um like my language skills feel like you were saying you're coding your older students to like make sense on piano. Like, you know, you just. But I can use coding. adult language. Yeah, I understand. But like, I feel like I'm using my language skills a little bit this much the same way. Like it's not as natural, like maybe a little bit, but definitely not as natural as a person who learned it when they were eight or nine. And I feel like I have to like just activate, like, okay, turn this button now, like and oh, sure, activate yeah. this word. Like, so it's very calculated how I speak. Uh, I guess what I was saying then is you can get certain places faster when you learn things as an adult. You can get to certain levels faster, but you might not ever be able to get to expert level huh. unless you learn in this quote unquote natural way as from childhood. Yes, I agree. I You'll don't never learn a second language as fluently very true. Maybe there are exceptions to this. Yeah, I don't really yeah. know. But my guess would be you would never learn it as fluently as, as you can when you're a kid. I mean, unless that's my only job right now from starting from now on, like I'm going to learn English. I'm going to perfect my accent, like my writing, everything. I probably can't do it. If but, you single-mindedly yeah. devoted yourself to that, it's possible. Yeah. I mean, you hear of these musicians that switch instruments when they're quite old and then become amazing. Like, oh, I was a harp player. And then I tried someone's French horn as a joke one day and they were like, yo, that was pretty good. If Give me, you know, 20 minutes with you and and I think you might be a natural at the horn or something. Well, never too late. I know a woman like that. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyways, just to put a little um, why I, I was into doing this episode. When I first started learning Turkish and we were first dating, right? I was sort of tripping out just before that I learned Turkish, just like, whoa, like this person I can tell is like, I have to speak in a different kind of way. It's just 
I became very sensitive, like looking at you, like, are you following the words? Are you pretending to follow the words? <laughs> you can sort of see if someone's like not paying attention versus like there, but not there versus like there, but struggling versus just like flowing along with whatever you're putting out. Mm -hmm. That's why you always check in with who you're talking to and see like, are, are they sleeping? Right. <laughs> yeah. Musicians can feel that energy from an audience, right? We're on stage. You can sort of feel how engaged they are. Just there's a certain energy in the room that you pick up on. So I feel like I was pretty successful at slowing down my um, communication and being much more aware of like, okay, how's this person hearing that? Well, that word, even though it's a common phrase, like there's probably no way she knew that word. So I'll replace it with this word, you know? You're very good at that, I think. It was, I, it was just a natural thing, but I hadn't really thought about that. I've talked to a lot of people who speak a different language, who come from a different language and learned English. But, and my assumption was sort of like, like a little too binary, like, oh, you learned English. Now you can understand me. And it's like, no, it's a lifelong journey of slowly understanding basic surface elements mm -hmm. and then realizing language is all mixed up and embedded with culture and yeah. life experiences. And the way you learn a language, your first language, is through the actual life experience. I mean, I don't you learn the word sour when you bite into a lemon, not when you're translating it in this textbook kind of way. Yeah. So now the memory of sourness is attached to the language sound and the visual of the spelling of sour right very true and then I, it doesn't give me the same effect when i hear it in english and i have a lot of problems like about this like i was reading yes, an it's article not invoked to the same yeah. deep emotional things i yeah. was reading an article this was about a couple of years ago and it was saying talking about like how your sense of perception of morality changes in a second language you're more sociopathic right i mean i'm not gonna <laughs> putting out a rough estimation <laughs> I wouldn't name it sociopathic, no, but yeah. definitely a little less sensitive. That's why sensitive. I said I should have put ish on the end of it. Sociopathic ish. Yeah, that that made it so much better. Thanks. Cool. <laughs> um, yeah. So who knows what changes in the different languages, right? I mean, you're still you in the sense that you're an integrated consciousness, but we have different elements of our personality, kind of like the movie we watched last night. What was it called? Inside Out. Yeah, where they show like this is Goofy Land. This is you know, family land, this is like mm -hmm. sad, whatever. And, and you sort of, and the, the key point is they were all networked together, but they were these separate islands, right? Yeah. And she was a child. So the idea is as an adult, those separate islands would become more and more integrated and you can just sort of balance the energy between all of them, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, did I read too much into the Disney movie? No, no I, I thought it was pretty that was deep. made for reading. I think it was much. a wink, wink at the adults kind 100%, 100%, of movie. Hundred percent, hundred percent. That movie uh, with is, goofy things yeah. for the kids. Because like I took my brother to see that movie, and he was quite old at that point. I think like maybe nine, ten, and was just like, ah, this is like too childish, like boring. And I was just like, uh, oh, yeah. like that was so deep. Yeah, you have to have a certain amount of introspection to really feel like the suddenness with which emotions come, and then other ones come, and mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah, so here we are. We're first dating and, and learning to better sort of gauge like how are my words being like understood or are they or whatever. And then I started learning Turkish, which gave me the opposite end. I started, I went in with so much confidence. I remember you were going to Turkey for the winter break and then you were coming back. It was like a week before you came back and I was on duolingo and i was just like i wonder if they have turkish like you know if they do like i'll do that 10 minutes a day and i bet you <laughs> i'll be you know cracking jokes at the dinner table in no time and i started that and you know the first few words you're just like okay whatever all right that's a different letter what's going on here and and then when i started to build sentences and stuff i was just like what and why this and not this what the hell does this mean what mm. what this is not to mention Duolingo is filled with mistakes. Very true. Don't <laughs> um, use Duolingo, guys. So I started getting this feeling of like what you said in the beginning. When you have a thought and you have, you can't find a pathway with which to deliver it, right? What are you reduced to? If, if you're in a country where no one speaks your language and you have no connection to theirs, you're reduced to monkey sounds and monkey gestures, right? Basically, yeah. I mean, obviously it can be more complicated than, than primates, not monkeys, but um, you can make very detailed faces and, and we point, right? You would just mm -hmm. be pointing at things and mim. So anyways, yeah, so I started, I kind of zoomed out on this idea of communication. And I've had this weird idea for a while of like, 
yeah, we had that struggle between English and Turkish. But then I started to notice the same struggle exists within English hmm. or within whatever the same language is. Yeah. And so let me read this quote. It's sort of like what blew my mind. And I, I started this note about communication as translation um, years ago. And I've just kind of been adding cool things I find to it. And then I turned it, tried to trying right now to turn it into an episode. Oh. <laughs> so the quote is uh, George Steiner from a book called After Babel. I didn't read the book, but I had a graduate professor that opened the class kind of saying this about talking about successful writing and communicating ideas. Mm -hmm. Any model of communication is at the same time a model of translation of a vertical or horizontal transfer of significance. No two historical epics, no two social classes, no two localities use words and syntax to signify exactly the same things or to send identical signals of valuation and inference. Neither do two human beings. Thus, a human being performs an act of translation in the full sense of the word when receiving a speech message from any other human being. Translation properly understood is a special case of the arc of communication, which every su successful speech act closes within a given language. In short, inside or between languages, human communication equals translation. That is so, so, so accurate. Yeah. That's why, like, you know, two things, like when you say something, like people misunderstand each other so often because of that reason, basically. Especially us, right? Yeah. <laughs> Certain words that might be more... Um, But like even people so, that are sharing the same language is what I'm trying to say. Yes. Like just so comfortably misunderstanding each other. Um, like us probably one, even more If I more call often. one person like, oh, that's, you're so thrifty. And they, they'll be like, oh, that's, that's nice. Thrifty is a way of saying like you find good deals, right? Yeah, I have a neg negative association, for instance. I'm okay, like, huh. so I'm, like, I'm saying there would be plenty of people that if they're the kind of person that likes to find sales and stuff, they'd be like, yeah, thanks. I got this good deal. But like, if you said that to someone out of context, that same speech message would mean you're cheap. Yeah. And that's a bad thing. You shouldn't be cheap, right? Even if we don't know why, we haven't unpacked it. It's just like an instinct. It comes with the, with modern society programming, right? Yeah. Um, so communication as translation means basically, when I take this um, SD card, out of the digital recorder at the end of the podcast and I pop it into your computer and I start editing the audio, I transfer the data, the information on that thing exactly, right? Mm -hmm. To a system that has the same protocol of reading the ones and zeros and, and building a file from it. Mm -hmm. So like computer communication is just like communicating exactly, right? Yeah. Although if you get down to the quantum level, maybe some, some kind of de degradation goes on. I don't know. But when you're communicating with another <laughs> biological being, right, you then have to go through this translation process. Um, Man Manolis Kellis is this cool guy that studies um, artificial intelligence at MIT. Mm -hmm. And he is also really knowledgeable about music. So I heard him on a podcast talking about all sorts of things, the meaning of life, music, all this, all this stuff. And um, he was talking on, on the Lex Friedman podcast about... Um, this idea that language came from music, music and ritual and dance and gestures came first and language evolved in its complexity and our ability to, to make those different sounds that the complexity required evolved gradually over time, mm -hmm. right? And let's see, he was talking about, um, He was basically talking about remembering a scene from a movie, right? We both saw the movie last night. Pick any movie. Two mm -hmm. people that see the same movie. And he's talking about how we don't even understand roughly in terms of consciousness how people encode information. Yeah. What I was trying to say is we know exactly how information is encoded on this SD card or on your hard drive of a computer. We don't, but people do, right? People who made them or designed them. We have no idea how how the neurons and biochemistry in the in the in the brain encode information, and we have no idea that me and you do it in exactly the same yeah. way. Certainly, we didn't literally in terms of life. Yeah. So we said, maybe the way I, that I'm encoding that scene from that movie is twisted with my childhood memories of running through the pebbles in Greece, and yours is twisted with the childhood memory of growing up in Russia. Nice. I was gonna say the same thing. Like maybe your they're so different. Biases, probably. Like everybody have different. 
kinds of set of biases like you know growing up and then that they developed and then they're interpreting well, the world not even in the negative that. sense biases yeah, yeah, yeah. meaning you should be able to bias between See, it just happened daytime like and i nighttime. used bias as a not a negative word and that you were like oh not in a negative so sense if you had <laughs> i think if you had used the word like they learn these distinctions right okay which is to make a bias between two mm -hmm. different things yeah. this is daytime that's nighttime Maybe you learn, I go for a run in the park during the day, not during the night where I can't see mm -hmm. who's waiting to get me out of the bush or something, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you have to be able to tell the difference between night and day. That's making a bias of, here are two things. I separated them into two categories, right? Yeah. So when you think about just knowledge in general, it's this ability to categor categorize the world and, and make distinctions out of the everythingness of reality. Mm -hmm. Then you have to learn how to communicate that through some something to another person, right? Mm -hmm. Whether that's, you know, so there are monkeys that communicate. Did, did, you, did I write anything about those? Or was I reading that somewhere else? I don't know. Like lots of primates communicate. They've done experiments where you teach a primate um, how to do sign language. Mm -hmm. They can learn like a hundred words, right? Oh, okay. Um, but monkeys, even lower cognitive ability monkeys, um, they have like 10, 20 different distinct ways of using their voice hmm. to make warning calls. So they have a distinct warning call for um, an eagle, mm -hmm. which can pick them off from the trees. They have one for a snake. They have mm -hmm. one for whatever the heck else hunts monkeys. Interesting. Maybe like a tree snake versus a ground snake. I don't know. But there, there's like a bunch of these subtle different things depending on the magnitude of the threat and like what the specific threat is from the air, from the ground, et cetera. Um, that's communication. That's transferring information between two brains, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea maybe is we evolved communication very gradually as, as the complexity of, of how we were thinking and the demand to be able to um, tell you how we were thinking and kept putting, there was a social pressure on us basically, mm -hmm. right? Do you know what the cognitive revolution is? No, I'm not sure. So um, basically around 2 million years ago, I suppose, um, we split off from the branch that became modern day chimpanzees oh, okay. and bonobos and stuff. <laughs> and then there was a bunch of different homo type okay, I know uh, that humans, too. homo erectus, homo habilis, mm -hmm. homo, you know, sapien, homo, mm -hmm. um, the Neanderthals, right? Mm -hmm. So we're li living amongst all of these kind of creatures. We're all walking somewhat upright, right? Yeah. We start to travel out of the plains of Africa and explore the world, blah, 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 blah. We just can't even imagine the time scale of a million years, right? Mm -hmm. We can't even imagine 100,000 years. But let's say somewhere, um, modern humans were basically as we are now by 100,000 years ago, at least, right? Still, that's so long. I mean, theoretically... Yeah. You know, 3,000 years ago was ancient Greece. I know. 3,000. That's forever that's, ago and impossible to even imagine. But then when you Not think of it, it's such a like recent, <laughs> like when you think of so the whole recent. thing. Yeah. It's so insane. So the software running on our brain, you know, got programmed way deeper than our pretty dumb awareness can pretend to understand, <laughs> right? All sorts of things about consciousness, right? So the cognitive revolution somewhere between a hundred thousand years ago and 50,000 years ago, for some reason, homo sapiens, which were very much like all these other caveman like creatures, our brain started taking off in, in size and density and ability. Right. Mm -hmm. That's probably when language s s developed as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's no exact uh, theory that's very strong that says this is exactly why it happened. But one idea is just basically the the complexities of our socializing, right? Yeah. Specifically gossip <laughs> and reputation management. We traveled around in hunter-gatherer bands of like 50 to 100 people. Mm -hmm. And um, that's called Dunbar's number, by the way. It's about the number of people you can remember in detail, yeah. like their faces and their personalities and keep like a mental log. Mm -hmm. Other, otherwise, you know there's a thousand people in your town, like you can't know all of them that well. You can't build a whole life story mm -hmm. of them all. So um, 
you could imagine something like, you know, rituals, behavior that you don't even understand, but just helps you survive, right? Mm -hmm. Start to happen. And then descriptions of those rituals, like all these distinctions. And we're talking, uh, you know, 10,000 years, another 10,000 years. And what's working? What's working? Mm -hmm. And what leads to our ability to physically make those sounds? Because if you look at other caveman, like homo creatures, mm -hmm. they just lack some of the ability to make the distinctions of speech that we can, right? Yeah. Something about their tongue or the way their throat was shaped or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think it was like NPR did this thing where they showed what Neanderthal's like voice would sound like. And it's actually mm -hmm. this weird high pitched, like, huh. you know, like, ah. you picture it like that. Yeah. It's um, you would picture like more of like a growl, like a gorilla or something, but why would it be that necessarily? So here's the cool part just to say like, this is why I can, um, just stress how cool um, language is to think about from this evolutionary perspective. This cognitive revolution changed something that sped up our evolution, which is instead of relying on biological evolution, genes to s randomly mutate and slowly have a social, have an environmental pressure to change very gradually over time, we began to live more in this conceptual world of ideas, right? we could abstract away from one event and, and say, that's a this. When the lion sneaks up on you and kills you, that's a insert word. And you've invented a word. I see. Okay. And now what is a word? It's a stand in for a concept. Yeah. And then when you never experience a certain experience, you don't have a word for that. And different languages sometimes have those words, which is really cool. Yes. That's a thing too. Yeah. But imagine yeah. having no words and then having your first word. Oh, that was a thing, right? The, like, the, it was an experiment, but I don't want to butcher the know. details of it. What was the experiment you thought it was? Uh, I think, like, I don't know. This was, like, a while ago. I don't want to, again, like, go research, but it was something, like, they put a kid, like, into a room, like, not in, let him interact, like, with anything, and then f just we're, we're testing if the kid was going to figure out any language, like, pick up or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then apparently it did, but I forgot what the first word that oh. the kid said, but whatever, just someone should look up probably. But if you think of like the time-saving ability and just the, cons the way it, that uttering a word, putting a label on something, encapsulating it with something, right, mm -hmm. now makes it a thing. So next time that happens, you, you, you don't have to understand it as if it's a new thing. That's true. So probably we are pattern recognizing first and then language and thinking maybe co-evolved, right? Language was useful to navigate the social pressures of our little hunter-gatherer bands. Mm -hmm. And by using language, the act of using language starts to make your thinking more categorical and you can make distinctions and then you start to memorize these things mm -hmm. and the ability to memorize more of these concepts, right? The chimp could only memorize a hundred sign language words. Well, our vocabulary and our home language is at least 20,000. And if you're really smart, 30 to 40,000, right? Mm -hmm. um, turns out you don't need a lot of words, right? <laughs> yeah. Most 90% of the words used in, in conversation are, are 300 or so for any given language, right? True, yeah. You could learn 90% of what's spoken by just learning the right 300 words, right? Very true. Anyway, so this language thing is developing and then all of a sudden we had this shared ability to make stories, right? Mm -hmm. And stories can change them instantly. I could tell a new story and now you pass that on, right? Yeah, or you say- and you've changed the behavior through communication, complex communication of all these different other homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. You don't have to rely on them to like over 10 generations learn a lesson of how to act. You can tell a story about how to act and communicate it and then leave it for future generations. Mm -hmm. So this language ability allowed for evolution to speed itself up in cultural evolution in the software that we're running on the hardware of the brain, which already evolved, right? So I, I don't know if this, is, um, if this is what I wrote in my notes or if it's a quote from the Sapiens book by Yuval Noah Harari, but... Um, uh, the cognitive revolution saw super fast, relatively speaking, of course, uh, improvement in our language abilities. This language ability allowed us to collaborate in large numbers. 
instead of 100 people, how about 10,000, right? Who mm-hmm. wins in an army of 10,000 versus random hunter-gatherer bands of Neanderthals, right? Yeah. We can share under one story, one idea, one motivation. Um, chimps can form groups of 50, max humans about 150. Mm-hmm. Personal communication and gossip keep things in order with that size, right? Yeah. That makes sense. Reputation management. And if somebody's a, a cheater who murdered someone to steal food and stuff, mm-hmm. they kick him out, right? Yeah. Or he becomes the new alpha. <laughs> Depends yeah. how successful he's This reminded cheating. me a lot of the Vikings that we've been watching, actually. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. That's basically how they lived. Yeah. Um, and that's really recent mm-hmm. compared to this, which we could be talking 40,000 years ago, mm-hmm. right? But way before settling down. Yeah. Um, personal communication and keep and gossip keep things in order with that size. But with the power of myth, storytelling, legends, etc., humans could organize into much larger groups and share these collective truths, right? These mm-hmm. collective myths. Um, and they're not genetic. They're just mental software. It's like getting an update on your Mac. Boom, we're updated, right? We can change true. the story. Even if that takes 25 years or a whole generation, it doesn't take 10 generations of like getting opposable thumbs, which probably took a thousand generations. Who, yeah. who the hell knows? Someone does probably. <laughs> <laughs> Not us. Um, and then another theory is that because we walked the most upright, that maybe freeing up our arms, that gestural communication started first. Oh, interesting. And uh, I mean, it makes sense. And we were able to make more complex gestures while our legs kept us moving, right? And then the gestures, you know, find mental concepts, find what primates already do, which is make different calls to signify different things. Well, that's just a, maybe language is just a really dialed up version of that, right? Mm-hmm. Probably, yeah. Probably started just like by sounds and everything. And yeah, here like we are. grunting, yeah, right? That's why it's, 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 it's an idea to think that m- music came first. And I don't mean music like Mozart, obviously. Oh, I, of course. I mean, people I mean, chanting and yelling. What's, and what's, what would be a basic element of, of music? Would pitch be. right yeah. so that making a distinction between a low sound and a high sound mm-hmm. oh right yeah did you know the male and female voice differ by roughly an octave uh yes so i do <laughs> so you can imagine early bands of hunter gatherers sitting around a fire and whatever primal melody maybe they found to represent an emotional state, a bonding ritual for the mm-hmm. group, right? Sitting around a fire all humming some kind of, uh, right? Whatever. I, I doubt it was that, but, and <laughs> they would be singing in, in this like almost like slow chant octaves or something, right? Yeah. And you have rhythm. It's right? just crazy to know that though. That Banging sticks is drums, right? <laughs> yeah. That they were, they didn't have any other form of communication. Like, like besides gestures and just, chanting like imagine like you're just trying to say something like what is it are they like we're ah, but you're one not wonders, trying to say something right yeah that's what i mean like one wonders like you are you like aren't. enlightened beings you know no no, like no caveman was being like oh how do i tell them what's wrong with my macbook right <laughs> so <laughs> you, not, you're like your needs in the world are pretty simple it's like i want to bang that i want to mate with that i want to communicate that though like, well you don't think you, the words yeah. that i used right because you don't have the words but the the action is still there yeah. now you know how self-aware of, of it are you like you know is language why we have this like such a separate ego like you know the so this this would be what i just described would be the one that makes the most sense to me as if i'm qualified to even say that but um the gradual approach where things discontinuously just kind of i, I mean continuously um just gradually evolved in conceptual mm-hmm. thinking and social the environmental social group pressure of gossip and and all of that pressured us very slowly to develop language yeah or you have someone like noam chomsky who thinks it's actually a genetic um some kind of genetic mutation that happened in perhaps even just one individual that allowed the brain to have what he calls universal grammar oh have you heard of universal grammar i heard of it but it's sort of like at some point in our evolutionary past, we were programmed with, not by a programmer, but by the randomness of nature, programmed with an, an ability to a universal grammar, like a grammar module in our brain. Mm-hmm. 
and it's not specific to any language, of course, because this happened way before modern languages existed, but it's the basic structure of what any language needs to be successful, mm -hmm. to be able to tell the difference between action words, verbs, and, you know, object words like nouns, right? Mm -hmm. um, and adjective words, right? And the order is different in all sorts of languages, but every human being is born, according to Chomsky's theory, which is like language developed very quickly after this mutation, right? I see. Interesting. Um, I think it's pretty controversial, and I think most people stick with the... Um, gradual. The gradual one. I see. Um, so Steven Pinker, who's a linguist from... Uh, I guess it's Harvard, yeah. Uh, he says, quote, interacting with an organism of approximately equal mental abilities whose motives are at times outright malevolent makes formidable and ever escalating demands on cognition. Now so, translate this to me. <laughs> <laughs> perfect example. Yeah. Okay, so he's saying that when you're in competition with other creatures that are about your smartness, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Your intelligence and the motives of these other individuals could be quite negative, right? Yeah. Trying to manipulate you, act sad so as to gain your sympathy, but then stab you in the back or who knows, right? <laughs> All these things had to be invented. It's like Ricky Gervais's movie, The Invention of Lying, right? <laughs> so he's saying this ability to lie well and detect lies well oh. is put the this pressure on our brains to get smarter and smarter, right? Very interesting to think about. Next week, I'm having this author, Robin Hansen, on, and he talks about this in um, The Elephant in the Brain, that um, just like redwood trees grow in forests, not with other regular trees, but with other redwood trees, right? It's the competition within the species that makes redwood so tall. Otherwise, it would be way too costly in terms of evolution. Mm -hmm. So same thing with humans. If you lived with chimps, you would have no advantage to develop language, right? It's the competition with other things just as smart as you over, you know, um, how many generations is 50,000 years? Say. Mm, uh, you A thousand me. generations? I don't know. <laughs> Depends on what the, what the age, what age they were living to. Um, so yeah, Robert Trivers, who's this uh, guy who studies all sorts of evolutionary psychology things, says... He argues that it was the arms race between lying and lie detection that was the primary drive b behind our intelligence. I see. That's very interesting. I mean, of course, it makes a lot of sense. We can't know, right? That's, yeah. that's kind of so weird Some people it. are still in the beginning of the their evolution in terms of that. Like, it's so obvious. Whatever. You mean humans? I'm just saying some of them, like, when someone lies to you and it's so obvious, mm -hmm. <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. I'm like, yeah. oh, you're in the beginning stages of that. Well, there's so many funny... Just when anybody does anything where their motives are obvious and the the speech communication vibe that they're using is so obviously manipulative, it's like, yeah. oh, is this like a dress rehearsal for this? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, like, like they're like hundred more years to go. No, it's just <laughs> curious about that thing because you know, uh, and you're like, why did your voice change? To I, know, that? Like, I know. Yeah. It's like somebody having a tell in poker. It's like you and you get a good hand <laughs> and you always like rub your nose or something yeah, people notice that right away that's true you and i might be like particularly sensitive to that from our conversations that's the conclusion i have but whatever um let's talk about uh a couple of things like uniquely weird to turkish versus english mm -hmm. um so I, I suppose the best way to sum it up which is what i wrote on my phone when i first learned turkish and was getting better within mm -hmm. the first year was it was so trippy to take something that I had previously experienced as random mouth sounds and it started to have meaning, right? Yeah. It's now to the point where you can't gossip about me oh, yeah. on the phone because <laughs> I'll, I'll fucking hear that right away, That's right? True. <laughs> um, now, will I hear precisely the subtlety with which you were delivering the message? No. Do you still understand if I speak really fast? No. Well... <laughs> It depends. I, again, the amount that I understand will go down if you're it was speaking a joke. fast. Oh, <laughs> communication yeah. uh, error. No. So another uh, uh, weird thing is, um, what's another weird thing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You tell me. You I saying. just like stared at the oven. I'm like, oh my god, I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> you were saying when you first started learning Turkish. 
the words kind of made sense all of a sudden. Oh yeah. And you were I, taking notes, you said. Oh, oh sure. Yeah. I, I, I just thought it was so trippy as it started to make more and more sense. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it would weirdly like make a lot of sense and my brain would effortlessly go right to the visual or the, the concept without, um, going through the translator inside the brain. Right. Yeah. So it's like if you have a windows computer and I have a Mac and, and we have to go through some sort of like module, like an external thing to translate your software encoding to read, you know, computers just do that automatically and, and all of that. But we actually have to do that between our languages. Right. Very true. Yeah. I just started laughing so hard because you described it so well. Where you were like, you would be moments where you're like, just, you know, just the things are shooting in the brain. Yeah. And there are moments that just, you hear the words, but they just don't mean it. No meaning. Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, it happens to me a lot still, just in case you're wondering. It happens Sometimes I'm like quietly it... staring at you in podcasts. That's what's happening. Like, oh, noted. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's just like, there's too much intake, I think, in those moments. I'm like, okay, I hear these words, but my brain is not... Right. matching them with the right categories like something i'm very behind type of thing at this point it's rare that there's a word that was said that i don't know mm -hmm. what's Turkish? yeah what's oh. more common is right. that i couldn't hear the distinctions between words and oh, let me give okay. you an example so this is also uh, a steven pinker quote from um uh, Steven Pinker, The Language Instinct, How the Mind Creates Language. And the, uh, some of the other quotes I read from this book, like he really hates Noam Chomsky's theory, like says some like witty academic, like taking him down kind of sentences. Oh, is that the one that said it's a genetic mutation guy? Yeah. Okay. The dis the, the discontinuity theory where it's just I like see. suddenly it, it emerged kind of um, approach. Hmm. All right. So this is a Steven Pinker quote. And this is kind of what's still... I'm getting better at in Turkish, but it's why I don't understand sometimes. Not that if you show me the text of the speech, I wouldn't understand it, but that the way we deliver speech orally, right? Mm -hmm. Orally through sound waves is very different than how we process it on the page. Mm -hmm. In the speech sound wave, one word runs into the next seamlessly. There are little silences between spoken words the way there are white spaces between written words. We simply hallucinate word boundaries when we reach the end of a stretch of sound that matches some entry in our mental dictionary. This becomes apparent when we listen to speech in a foreign language. It's impossible to tell where, where one word ends and the next begins. The, seamless, the seamlessness of speech is also apparent in oronyms, strings of sound that can be carved into words in two different ways. So here's the example. I'll say it what fast. What is oronym? It's strings of sounds that can be organized into different ways to make different sentences. So tell me what sentence you hear when I read this. Okay. Oh, God. The good can decay many ways. The good can decay many ways? The good can decay many ways. The good can decay um, any ways? Is that what I'll it is? I'll say it or? one more time. Oh, God, fuck. The good can decay many ways. The good can decay many ways. Okay. So that's one. But I could also be saying the good candy came anyways. The good candy came anyways. Okay. The good candy came many ways. The good candy came anyways. <laughs> okay. It's the same sounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I say it, I, I should have said it more robotic probably. Like the good candy came anyways. The good candy came anyways. The good candy came anyways. I mean, I cannot unhear it candy. now, of course. <laughs> but it's sort of fun. like when you're looking at an optical illusion and you can switch it. Yeah. We have similar sentences. I wish I could Back remember one. Yeah, I can't remember. So that's what's really hard in a, in a second language is all of that blurs together and you just hear like, especially in Turkish, which just makes words like endlessly long mm -hmm. and, and cuts them short in speech versus how you see it on the page and all this stuff. Um, you probably experienced this when you first came here. You're like waiting for people to say, I am going to dinner tomorrow. And they say, I'm, I'm going to dinner. <laughs> Going to dinner, yeah. going to dinner, going to dinner. I, mean, I still have that sometimes where I like was people, going when to go. People, some people go. like really mumble their speech and I just like, it really affects my, I don't want to say communication. Obviously it affects my communication, but it affects my 
just interaction with them generally. I'm like, I don't want to talk to this person. I don't, I have no idea what they're saying. Like yeah. how yeah. long I can fake this. Like, you know what I mean? Uh, you <laughs> had that experience when you were in North Carolina and somebody oh, God. With, a, uh, with a pretty thick um, you uh, left Southern me accent at home. was talking to her and she was, yeah, she was alone. <laughs> Where we pretended like we were understanding each other for an hour straight. <laughs> well, see, the difference is he probably thought you were. I know, him. I know, I know, I know, I know. That's the sad A lot thing. of people just need you to yes them to death. So like that is very worst true. case scenario, if somebody says something to you in a foreign language and you're not sure what they said and you've already asked them three times to repeat themselves, <laughs> you just nod along and go, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that happens to me like every day. And you hope you're not like my grandma who, when she had hearing problems, <laughs> um, she, I guess she was like walking out either without her hearing aids or before she got them or something. And, um, she said, like, you know, getting the mail or something. Said, like, how's it going to the neighbor? And they were like, not great. Like, my father died or whatever. She was like, okay, sounds good. Have a good one. <laughs> I remember the story. She told us. You know, so there's a few times where that um, that won't work for you. But, yeah, generally, I, I don't ask people to repeat themselves after three times. And I just go, I hope I understood them. You know, <laughs> it happened to me on the phone with someone uh, back in December. Like they were. How do you still remember back in December? Because like, it happens to me on a daily basis that I have to like <laughs> just, you know, send those <laughs> memories to the memory dump. Oh. If anyone watched Inside Out, yeah. is what I'm doing. Like, I have to like where they'll, po- push they'll poke at you from the dream world. Or basically that yeah. they'll feed them back up, right? That's funny. Um, the other thing uh, is. Uh, this word dialogue, right? So Manolis Manolis Kellis was also talking about that. Perhaps language also developed as like because of conversation, not like just you thinking to yourself, but you having to vocalize your speech. Do you think more in images or shapes, or or is it more in language? Do you like see the words you're thinking? Do you just say them like auditorial, it's auditory very, to yourself? For me, it's very auditorial, like. If that's a auditory, is that a word? Auditorial. Let's go with it. Sure. It it's is a successful now. communication, right? Yeah. Which is like it's a word if if I successfully know what you mean. Okay, then then good. It's a word now. <laughs> not if you're taking the TOEFL or something, but yeah. probably not. Anyway, nothing is visual for me in terms of language because that's not how I learned it anyway. It's if very, I say like, snake, do I you mean, see I, the words snake. I do. I do. I do. What I'm saying is... Or do you see the image of snake is what I mean. Oh, I do see the image of snake. But I'm just saying when I'm talking, the words, like I don't see the words. I like sure, okay. hear them. Side note, when I say the word snake, whatever pops into my mind, very different from whatever popped into your mind, guaranteed. So do we really do you, know what that word means? Do you see the word itself or the image itself? Image. Pictures? Okay, me too. I think that's where... I'm the, only, the only time I see... The image of the spelling of a word is if somebody's asking me to spell it or I'm trying to spell it, like writing. And you're asking and, me to spell it. Yeah, because I'm, I'm better at spelling, at spelling than you are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I put my mental development skills somewhere else, apparently. <laughs> I don't know where. <laughs> so isn't that cool, though? Right. I don't know what you pictured when I said snake. Yeah, no idea. I mean, there's no way of Mine finding changes it. changes every time I recall it, too. Yeah, there's no way of finding it unless we were getting there, right? Neuralink, something like that. Oh Never. yeah, the Neuralink thing is is that's what Elon Musk is making this sort of like way to computer connect to the brain. Hmm. the The problem is what I already said before, which is that we don't know how how we encode information. But like, his so initial... how are you going to translate it from the hard drive of this to the? Well, his initial um, intention, I think, is to cure diseases, like not yeah. necessarily. But carry, uh, but, it, but eventually, it would be that you could just Wi Fi book a flight by thinking about it. Yeah. Or it was saying like it is going to be like, he was saying it's going to be like Black Mirror. You have to, you can like save and replay memories and stuff. I want to want that. Well, so the the, the, the two things are one, how are they going to talk to each other? And and two, again, what the, what Manola said before is like, we, we watch the same movie and we don't even remember it the same. Mm-hmm. That's not what remembering is. There, there's some networking process when you form experiences, right? We know there are these two forms of memory, short-term and Mm long-term. And one of the things that apparently sleep and dreaming does is work out these storms of of neuron connections, aka information, right? And decide what's useful, what's important, what to put into long-term memory. For, as an example, if I say, do you remember 
um, January of 2020. Mm-hmm. Pretty easy to remember. It's just over a year ago. December 19th, 16th, 1991. Well, I don't know. Where's that from? That. Oh, what? <laughs> sorry. We were watching uh, Captain America yesterday. That was oh, the date oh. from the- I'm very sorry. My, I kind of spaced out for a second, yeah. <laughs> but if I asked you what you were doing on December 20th, right? If you looked at your calendar, you might be able to get it, but you probably wouldn't get it unless you looked, right? Uh-huh. And then if I said, like, what were you thinking about at two o'clock on December 20th? It's like, no, that's we don't remember that level of detail. Yeah. If we do, it's in the memory dump, like from inside out and like, who knows? Mm. But we do have this process of like integrating what our brain decides is important and putting those into places we can recall quite quickly as long as we're poked. Mm-hmm. So if you ask me to remember what I'm doing on a certain date, I might... Be like what? I don't know. Like June was I in Turkey? No, that was the year. I've, and you confuse years, right? Yeah. But if if somebody pokes at that memory from a different perspective and be like, oh, remember when you spilled that beer all over yourself, all over your shirt and pants before the concert? You know, and you smelled like beer the whole time or something. That never happened, by the way. <laughs> um, yep, never. Of course, the memory just floods in with all the detail, right? Mm-hmm. Who cares what the calendar said? I remember the relevant information, right? So I find this this stuff really fascinating um just however language came about cognition with it maybe there's an influence like thinking in a language we listened to this podcast today that was from hidden brain and it was all about how the language you're brought up in actually influences how you can think because language is the categorical system right some languages have gender um some languages like have gender in third person pronouns like he she like we have right yeah. um you happen to come from turkish which doesn't have that right yeah we have the you have one yeah gender neutral for third person they obviously have words that distinguish between men and women mm-hmm. um but when you're telling a story you could get a couple sentences in maybe a minute in before it's obvious what the gender of the person you're talking about is because mm-hmm. you're using this third person could be either one yeah um, they were talking about uh, Indonesian. I think. What was that. the language where they don't have left and right? Oh, that was a. Um, I think started with a P. A, aboriginal, like Australian Aboriginal language, or am I making that up? It started with a P, but I don't want to take a stab at making yeah. up okay, a country. I don't know the exact. I, I thought it was the Aboriginal language, but I don't know. But you've probably heard of these languages. There's a couple of them where they don't have left right, but they have this permanent like compass as part of their conceptual framework, right? So they always know where North is, not because they're keeping track of it in the way that your left, right, where am I in space keeps track of it, but Mm -hmm. because they just program into the conceptualization of how they view themselves in the world. They have this bird's eye view of where they are on the map of the world. That is so cool. Like it's impossible. I'm not saying. So you don't think I'm going to the left. You actually see yourself turning on this conceptual space of, of like looking at a map, you know, when you're on Google maps and you can, you're like, wait, is it that road or that road? And you turn your phone and the little like beam light kind of changes. And I I still like go to a lot of places with that. (laughs) Everybody know in New York, like walk. Even in New York city where it's like, I gotta go up and over. And I'm like, Oh, which way is up? Hold on. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's a me problem. Oh, the numbers are going down. Is this up still? (laughs) Um, yeah, you should be able to navigate Miami beach and New York and Manhattan pretty well with just, um, I, I, I do. Without, like, without the Google map It thing. depends where I am. Anyway. So, yeah, but these people, let's say you you roll, you, you know, you're running outside and you twist your ankle. Someone goes, what's wrong? We would say, I twisted my right ankle. They would say, I twisted my west ankle. And then turn the and other then, way. And then and when they turn saying. around to talk to their friend, they'll be like, yo, did you see what happened to my east, east ankle? ankle. Yeah. <laughs> but it wouldn't be confusing. They wouldn't think they switched anything. In fact, if they didn't switch the direction, they'd be like, I thought it was the that way angle that got hurt ankle that got hurt right and then like don't they say is this is i i think it was the same language don't they say hi before hi they say which way they're going that is their hi like, right yeah like oh southwest whatever yeah. this way goodbye <laughs> like something like that <laughs> so crazy and and so this i think it was a russian woman who who was trying to learn this language and she was there for a while and then at some point she said to her friend or whatever oh my god i don't know if this is crazy or not but i finally found a fast way to figure out how to use these direction words without without taking so much time. She's like, mm-hmm. I kind of see myself in this bird's eye view of where I am on the space. And they're like, 
is there another way to do it? <laughs> right? It's like, of course that's how you do it, right? So, so it's still very difficult, but it'd be like saying like, um, oh, not only do you have to do the left hand part of the violin, you also have to use the bow in just the right way. You're like, oh, I didn't know there was a whole nother thing. Like, I still can't do it. It's like when, you're <laughs> when you first try something like that, it seems impossible, but you can change your conceptual like landscape, like switching from driving on the left to the right or something, right? Like yeah. going to Britain or whatever. Um, yeah. So that's like a, a really radical way that language can be different, right? Sure. Some languages are more compatible than others. Let's just end with a couple of these, these concept words that, you know, sure. If I'm talking about an apple, it's like, you know, when I say Apfel in German, <laughs> Great Apple <accent. laughs> and Elma, right? Uh -huh. uh, shit, that's all the apples I know. Um, ah, I what's forgot. it in French? I'm trying to remember. I don't remember. Um, they all. It's again. It's not an exact one-to-one -one correspondence between my apple that I'm communicating and all the other apples, right? But it's pretty good, and you're going to know what I mean roughly. You won't maybe know the kind of apple. You won't know everything, right? But it's, and then there are more complex concepts, right? Democracy. <laughs> well, you see what I mean? That, I have no idea. It's a mouth. I don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mouth sound. <laughs> I bit my lip as I did that. <laughs> so that unsuccessful communication. Apple is a mouth sound, right? So is democracy. But Apple is a much simpler concept, right? It's just a stand in for this object, right? Maybe it's more complicated. I don't know. <laughs> but certainly not as complicated as democracy or um, good, right? Imagine how long it took the concept of good to develop, right? Yeah. Um, I think I understand what you mean. So words can be pretty complicated, right? But my favorite is when there's words that don't have a translation, or if they do, they require paragraphs of words from the second language and just one word stands in for the whole concept. And what's unique is that not that you're able to do that. You could name anything, right? I could name any concept of a complicated thing that we've spent years developing. I could just call it something, you know, call a call, call, call. Trying to invent a word, call of. I mean, we don't have to. There are like words I call, forgot. Call a fornium. Sure. That. It's it's the whole two years of me describing like how to name words. You know, like you could make a concept, but if it's useful, when I use it, you should be able to quickly know what the hell I mean, right? You should probably have one about the feeling that you get when you step onto a puddle of water with socks on. Like we need yeah. a word for that first. <laughs> there pro there might be a word for that in certain languages if it happens all the time, right? So there's a couple um, that I've heard about. One was on this podcast today. There was a Japanese word, and I honestly forget oh, yeah. what it was already. Oh, I remember the mean, like the translation, but I don't know. What the was word. the translation? The translation was when you're. We actually have the same word. I thought of that in Turkish. Oh, because it's not laziness, but it's like oh, like you're sitting down, like you know, you really want. And it was saying like you want a bag of potato chips or something. But you're like cozied up in your pajamas and everything, even though you have like the you know, grocery store downstairs, like you just don't want to like put your shoes or like coat above your like pajamas and then just go down there and get the potato chips. Like it's laziness. Of, it's just like I, I can't bother type yeah. of word. We have ushanmek for that. And I've been trying to teach you. I don't know if you've heard of this. You know ushanmek. Use it in the context. Uh, ushan, like you can say maybe, oh, Yanka, like let's take a walk. And I'm like, ah, oh, shandem. Oh. It's like uh, in the positive, it means I can't be bothered. Yeah, I'm too lazy. You say in English, but lazy is like a different concept. Like shandem no, yeah, is like lazy would I mean can't something be totally. bothered. Basically, I yeah. can't be bothered. Exactly. That would be a good one. Yeah, same in Turkish. Yeah, and and yet it's again just like yes, technically Apple is a whole library of experiences I've had with apples. These things are even more conceptual, right? It's like a library of experiences with a complicated emotion of like, I really want this thing, but I will blah, blah, blah. So then I was thinking today, as I'm reading about this, like, wait, the word, the Japanese word for our podcast, kodawari, is exactly one of these words. Very true. It's not impossible to find the software that figures out how to get from kodawari to saying what kodawari is, but you can't do it with a one-to-one -one move. Yeah. You can't go, what's kodawari mean? Oh, it means banana. 
Yeah, because there's there no one word for it, basically. Yeah. There's probably a one-to-one correspondence for the word for banana. Mm-hmm. Sometimes maybe there isn't, right? Yeah. Like in Turkish, we, we have words for things that you in Turkish use other words for. Oh, right? like remember puddle? You were asking me like, what is a puddle? And I was just like yeah. a hole with water in it. Yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> She's like, what do you mean a word for puddle? It's just a hole with water. I was like, yeah, but what, what do you, how do you, you know, signify that to somebody if you're saying, be careful, don't step in, in the puddle. She's like, you would say, be careful, don't step in the hole filled with water. <laughs> Just imagine me going through life here, though, not being able to say, like, kolay gas into someone or, like, or hayır olsun. Like, we had those kinds of things. Like, when someone yeah. you see someone working, you wish or them, eyvallah. like, or that, yeah. I mean, eyvallah is not something that I use so often. So I'm Actually, like, there's a good that. one for English. It's cheers. It's like a yeah. bro way of saying, like, thanks to someone who did you a favor be like, okay. or said something nice. Be like, uh-huh. you know, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about, you know, your, your grandpa passing away. Yeah, cheers, man. I see. Kolai gas is the one that I'm missing though. When you're seeing a worker, like even like a worker in the street, mm. like someone cleaning trash, something, this, that, like. Or, or you pick up takeout food and you're that, leaving the place. You're like, leaving the place. You, know, you thanks, say. Kolai gas. Kolai gas literally means like. Oh, may it come may easy. May it come easy. Exactly. Yeah. We um, say that a lot. And then I, that limits my interaction with people a lot. I'm there's a lot of course. those phrases in Turkish that are just easy ways to be polite and to keep like um, a, a more honorable you know, behavior between people, right? When somebody enters anywhere, you, you say like, is like, you know. It's welcome, but not really gr- welcome. Gr- it's welcome, but it really <laughs> means like, great that you came. Yeah, and then they say, Hosh felt, Bulduk, like, it yeah. means great that we found it. Yeah, yeah. The, Even the translation, uh, it doesn't satisfy me as of much. Course I'm it hearing doesn't. them, I'm like, eh. But it does, when you study languages like that, it does tell you something about the function of the actual emotions from way back when mm. and what, what what's underneath it essentially, right? Not when it's attached to our modern day culture, but like good that you came, good that we found, you know, like <laughs> it, it, see, it makes sense to me that that would carry through, even though it doesn't sound that way. It doesn't literally mean I journeyed from the other city to come visit you to tell you the news oh. of the savior being born, you know, <laughs> the, you know, everything's so serious. It's like now you just go over to your friend's house for dinner. You say, Hush, Gavin. It means like, you know, I'm glad you arrived. Welcome, yeah, you know. True. Or get to be shosun. So many things yeah. like you, you, when you translate it in a basic way, it's like, oh, I just need to get the basics of this translation out. Fine, cool, whatever. But if you really had to translate it, if, if like when you're in a relationship or something, right? And you have to like understand what the person means with more precision than just like roughly what they meant, right? Mm-hmm. Then all of a sudden you realize like translations are really sketchy. Right. Yeah, very true. And words mean different things. Like this word "kodawari" is a whole. I wrote a whole couple articles trying to figure out exactly what it means and trying to unpack like wh- why I love this word and, and mm-hmm. put it into more, you know, English meaning. But it took me lots of writing. I don't know of a word that just captures all of that. Right. Yeah. It would take lots of cultural behavior and shared experiences to make a concept into a new word. Right it's just kind of crazy like new words get invented either because the academics realize they need a distinction between two really subtle things right mm-hmm. or because the social pressure it's useful to make that distinction mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. or because maybe some kind of behavior evolves that that you need to label in some kind of way right yeah True. so is there any other what any other ones that don't translate from turkish that you can think of Mm, a lot we okay actually i was reading this like earlier there, we have a word for the let me just read this directly this word the word is yakamos uh-huh oh i know this word you yeah know? okay do you want to no you go for it okay yakamos is that beautiful phenomenon that phenomenon non that happens at night when the shimmering moonlight reflects on the water it also describes the blue fluorescent glow created by bioluminescent plankton in the water. Mm. That's the word. What were we listening to? It was a random linguist guy. Or was it Eric Weinstein by chance? Maybe. I think it was. He was, because he always talks about Turkish. It's one of his favorite languages, That's I so think. so interesting. Um, and kind the few times, like- you know, he's got like a million followers on Twitter or whatever. The few times I've gotten him to tweet back at me is when I say something in Turkish. I'm like, merhaba dostum, like... You know, 
her yaptığınız için çok teşekkürler. <laughs> and then he'll respond something in Turkish or whatever. Or, you know, mm-hmm. it's the only time I can <laughs> get his po- attention. <laughs> poke, out, po- poke out of the weeds to um to uh, say something. Uh, but yeah, I think it was on a podcast where he was talking about Turkish and he said that was his favorite word. Yeah, it's a really pretty word, I think. Um, I have no idea if we successfully communicated what I wanted in this episode about what language and communication is, uh, but I guess we'll find out. Yeah. Anything else that you want to say or do? Or I think that's it. Is there any cool quotes that I can end with? Oh, I'll end with this. I don't know if it's a cool quote or not. What is truly arresting about our kind is better captured in the story of the Tower of Babel, in which humanity, speaking a single language, came so close to reaching heaven that God himself felt threatened. The Tower of Babel is a story from the Bible that says, like, mm-hmm. we were collaborating so much. And I guess trying to build a, a tower to heaven would be like trying to fully understand our place and, and become gods, right? That God created all the different languages to confuse us. Huh. Interesting. Um, well. <laughs> but, I mean, it's a concept of like, you know, uh, what if we all spoke the same language or will we all speak the same language? Languages are dying all the time, you know? That's true. Well, maybe, and maybe with then. each language that dies, dies thousands of years of wisdom. Wisdom culture. Because that stories. wisdom is unique yeah. to that language because language is encoded in how we even think, right? Sure. <sighs> okay, how do I express that I'm hungry and we should go eat salmon? Yes, I think so. Like that? I guess yeah, so. I think that was very clear. <laughs> Dinner time. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. See ya. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening to this episode of Exploring Kodawari. If you enjoyed it, we hope you'll consider sharing it on social media and with friends. You can also help us out by leaving a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Those help us more than you would think. And if you'd like to help us out in a more substantial way, consider going over to our website to make a donation through PayPal. Links are in the episode notes for this. You can do this as a one-time donation or a recurring monthly donation. All of that support will help us to set aside time in order to create content for the podcast and the blog. And finally, please get in touch with us and say hi, either on social media or privately through email. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening and see you next time.